in the process of making paper, there's a chloride, chloride alkali process that was developed in the 1950s that used mercury in the process. And one of the byproducts of the paper making was to dump mercury. They dumped um, 20,000 pounds of mercury directly into the river system. That was on the sediment, and, and the, the bottom dwelling creatures will ingest it, and then any, anything that preys on those creatures will uh, have that mercury accumulate in their body. The mill is still open. They've stopped dumping mercury since the 70s, but they are still in full operation and they are using a lot of cancer-causing chemicals to process their product. Mm. Chemicals that are going into our water system that we drink every day. And then I understand why our children are being born with cancer in the brain and like our people are dying from high diabetes rates, heart disease, kidney disease. Because those fishing lodges were shut down. So with no tourism, there were no jobs, and that began a cycle of dependence on welfare for the community. So it, had, it has health effects, it has economic effects. Members of Grass and Arrows would tell you um, spiritual effects as well, because of their, uh, their relationship with their environment has changed. When I was a child, we mostly lived from the forest, and now I'm 51, and we are pretty much totally from like Safeway or Bolso Club or no frills, like our people have to go to those stores to, to eat and there's no more moose in our area. They've moved away from our area because of the logging and so our moose, like it's really hard to find moose and the deer have moved action to Kenora. If you go to Kenora, you'll see deer just walking by the street and like it really seems odd, but we're getting used to it, like seeing the deer have moved into the city, which is really weird. <laughs> so it just feels everything off keel and off balance, and we are not sustainable in our community right now. There's an assumption that the way of life of one person, of one group of people, holds more value inherently than the way of life of another people. When we look at treaty, for example, which treaty is an agreement to share the land. It could be a framework for environmental justice because people would have to work together to determine how it is that the environment will be used so that both ways of life can be satisfied in such a way that they remain healthy and it's sustainable, but it doesn't impact negatively on the other. But clearly that hasn't happened. It's, then it becomes clearly a case only of economics, but not holistic economics. It's just economics for profit, right? And so a profit-driven industry takes uh, precedence over any other type of assessment of environmental value. So what happens is the forest around Grass and Arrows becomes cut and they lose their way of life as well as their health. It's clearly an example of environmental injustice. I want the industry to shut down and I also want the government to clean up the river. And these are two very impossible wishes. Stop being racist to my people and to say that our cries are legitimate and to really listen to what we are, what we are yelling about. Environmental injustice inherently has environmental racism built into it, yes. But science shows us, conversations show us that we are actually all related, and there is no difference between us. And it's not a matter, ultimately, of non-Aboriginal versus Aboriginal. Those divisions are artificial because water flows. And it's only a matter of time before everybody gets sick. Yeah. We need to address this now, not for the Aboriginal people, not for Indigenous rights, not for human rights, but for human dignity. Canada is not the first world. There are third world conditions in this first world, and that's on the First Nation communities.